Welcome to Citizen Live at One. I'm Julie Kishuru. Interior Cabinet Secretary Joseph Olelenku has today launched a national digital population registration database, which is aimed at sealing security loopholes in the registration of persons and also setting up the National Master Database of Kenya. Speaking during the launch, Olelenku put on notice officers who may use the new system in place to uh, perpetuate illegalities. Let's see what he had to say. The National Population Registry being set up is set to seal loopholes that have existed in the registrations of persons as well as provide proper data of persons when dealing with matters in security. Interior Cabinet Secretary Joseph Olelenku, who officially launched the platform, said it was critical that this is done to form a national registry database. In complete registration, uh, quick identification systems, and corruption in various registration departments is one of the key factors which have greatly contributed to its security in the country. The register is also set to help in the fight against crime and will be registering persons below the age of 18. Those above the age of 18 are already in the database and these will only be digitized. The government intends to spend 8 billion Kenya shillings to register Kenyans aged 12 years and above for the next three months to create Kenya's first ever national digital registry. The database will capture details such as birth records and asset holdings. Lenku put on notice all that may try to abuse the system. The government is putting on notice those officers who may be tempted to try and misuse the new registration regime to perpetuate corrupt and illegal ways uh, of their own blockades. Once completed, the database is expected to provide a reference point that will be used by government ministries and the private sector alike to create solutions to existing problems. Eunice Nakaburu, Citizen and One. Well, court affiliated leaders are currently meeting at the Ufunga Mano to launch the collection of referendum signatures. Martha Karua is among other leaders outside court who are in attendance. We're now joined by Francis Kashuri on the phone. Francis, please give us the latest at Ufunga Mano this morning. Good afternoon, Julie. Indeed, the Ufunga Mano meeting going on. Uh, it's a meeting organized by the Okoa Kenya Initiative. Uh, this is the uh, 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 team that has been set up by the Coalition for Reforms and Democracy Code, together with other like-minded partners, uh, among them the civil society and other political parties that are not necessarily affiliated to code, uh, to push for um, uh, some key changes to the constitution that was enacted in 2010. Uh, and of course, the push for a referendum uh, now formally begins today, so to say, Julie, uh, because uh, this function today is being used to initiate the process of collecting at least one million signatures that are required in the Constitution uh, to validate any uh, proposals to amend the Constitution. And so, court has also, uh, or the whole Kenya has also set up an advisory council uh, that uh, includes, among others, uh, representatives, representatives from the civil society. And uh, if I can uh, tell you quickly, Julie, some of the members who have been uh, uh, appointed to be members of the Okoa Kenya Advisory Council. They are John Gidongo, George Kibero, uh, Archbishop Zakaz Okoa of the Catholic Diocese of Kis uh, Kisumu, uh, Dr. Richard Liki, Dr. Adam Zolo, and Bishop Timo Bindabuki. Uh, that team, uh, Julie, will team up uh, with uh, the Okoa Kenya uh, Committee of Experts that is chaired by uh, lawyer Pop Mangi to drive the referendum agenda. And of course, the four issues that uh, Julie Cord wants to put as the referendum issues are uh, number one, land reform, number two, electoral reform, three, increasing the amount of allocations to county governments, and four, uh, insisting on inclusivity in public appointments. So the function is going on, Julie. We are here to hear uh, former Prime Minister Raila Odinga and uh, Senator Moses Otangula, who is also a co, -co principal. Uh, they are expected to speak shortly, as well as the North Kenya leader, Martha Karua, who is also in attendance, together with other political leaders from other political parties, Julie. 
Thank you so much for that, Francis, and more on that in the later bulletins. That meeting has been ongoing since morning and still continues. Now, Bungoma County is in the grip of a circumcision fever that will see many boys initiated into what they describe as manhood. A crucial player in the ceremony is a group of around 70 men who are registered circumcisers and whose specialized knives enjoy a history of their own. Joseph Simiu, for instance, has wielded the knife for 22 years and counts many prominent men among his graduates. Gatete Njoge was in Bungoma, and he witnessed Simiu in action in the first part of our special series, The Western Cut. The tune symbolizing the start of the circumcision period in the Luya community. The young and the old brave in the early morning chill. Family and friends dancing throughout the night. All this to celebrate the courage of a loved one who has decided to undergo this important rite of passage. Silent heroes of this well kept tradition keep working to ensure that this rite of passage remains a success in years. Every early morning in the month of August during even years, they prepare their knives ready for the act. How blessing welcomes us to the homestead of Joseph Simim, a man who for the last 22 years has ensured that over 500 young boys in Bungoma County and have won the right of passage. Today, clad in his uniform, he's on his way to increase the number of boys who have faced one of his treasured 18 circumcision knives. Malaha village is his destination. The young man who had been taken to the river at dawn arrives home accompanied by a group of people, and in a split of a second, Simeo executes the all important cut that will see the young man transition to man. After which the news disappears. To him, it's only a day's work passed over to him by his father who discovered he had the gift in 1956. <laughs> The father of eight who also works as a security guard at a hotel tells me not everyone can be a traditional circumcisor or muheri as they are known in the Luya community. One is known to have the gift whenever he reacts to a particular song which is usually sung on the morning before the cut. However, those who are allowed to perform the cut are only men who are married and their firstborn children are male. There are special laws for those who have the gift to become circumcisors. The circumcisors conduct a special ceremony to anoint the knives to be used in the exercise. A white chicken is slaughtered during the ceremony. To them, health is of key importance. For his passion and zeal for the job, Simiu emerged the best among over 70 traditional circumcisers who participated in a symposium organized by the Bungoma County Government on 21st July. Alongside his crucial traditional work, Simiu is also a church elder at the Salvation Army and says his religion does not interfere with his traditional beliefs. I'm curious to know just how much he earns as a traditional circumciser. 
To Simiu and the rest of the traditional circumstances, the resolve by many parents to take their children to hospital for the cut has been a key challenge to their work. Simiu bids farewell to us with a quote he shares with all the ones he has cut. To him, the long awaited month of August brings with it a ray of hope that gives him a chance to do what he does best with his life. Allowing him to play his part in keeping this tradition alive despite the changing times. For Joseph Simiu, a traditional circumstance in Bungoma County, for him, it's not only a way of maintaining his culture, but also a source of income. Reporting from Bungoma County, I'm Gatete Njoroge. Thank you for that, Gatete. Police in Naivasha gunned down two suspected cattle rustlers moments after a group of youths raided a home in Kabati Estate and killed two men during a botched cattle theft incident. The injured are believed to have been part of the alleged killer gang. However, five other suspects managed to escape the police dragnet along the Nairobi Kinangop Road. The bodies of the suspects were later transferred to a nearby mortuary. Police say several suspects have been arrested in recent weeks following an intensified crackdown on cattle rustling. Ni wanaume wawili tumesikia tu saa hii asubuhi tumekuja hapa tukakuta maofisa tukakuta wanaume wawili wamegawa lakini tunafikiri ni kwetu wameletwa sababu si hapa tu wajui. Na ile ya mzima tumeangalia watu hawajui. Sasa na sababu hapa kuna security ya kutosha tunashindwa watu wametolewa pandigani lakini baadaye tutakuja kujua wametolewa pandigani. Well, four county executive committee members in Vihiga County have survived a dismissal from their dockets after Kisumu Industrial Court issued orders to restrain the Vihiga Governor Moses Akaranga from effecting a decision made by the county assembly to fire them. The county assembly accused the four of incompetence and misappropriation of funds. Abdi Rahman Abdullahi now reports. A sigh of relief for the four Vihiga County Committee members who came under fire after the County Assembly threatened to impeach them. Vihiga County Governor Moses Akalanga said the move has adversely affected service delivery in the county and called on the county resident to remain calm. Akalanga raised red flag of a mini conference that his officers organized, which he said attracted the bills. I want to be saying the interest issue to each of the, each officer once per week. So I'm going to set aside Thursdays where I'll be receiving all books showing the interest which has been taken. However, the governor has shuffled his cabinet and appointed other officials to head the affected dockets in acting capacity. The affected dockets are Treasury, Transport and Infrastructure, Education, Science and Technology, Industrialization, Trade and Tourism, Public Service and Administration. Rahman Abdullahi for Citizen TV. Now we move on to a story that aired last night and has a lot of people talking today. The Makonde community has been living in Kwale on the Kenyan coast for close to 100 years. But the 40,000 members of this tribe remain uncertain about their nationality. Well, why is that? It's because the community that originated from Mozambique claims its members have been denied recognition as Kenyan citizens by successive governments who consider them foreigners. But as Evelyn Wamboy reports, the Makonde insist Kwale is the only home they know. Listen closely to the beat of drum and song. It's the sound of culture and tradition. 
tradition that introduces us to a small community in an equally small village in Kwale County, the Makonde people. They are known more as entertainers, performing in many public functions and cultural events. But it is when the music stops that their story begins for a people that originally came from Mozambique back in the 1920s to provide labor for the colonialists in their sisal farms and who never returned home. <laughs> Decades later, and the country they now call home refuses to recognize them as citizens, leaving them as a nowhere people. <laughs> The Makondes, who are also wood carvers, have tried to blend in as Kenyans. And especially such young ones who only get to hear about their Mozambique heritage. Their history, though, continues to haunt the future of such youth who know not where to turn. Recently, when the Mozambique High Commissioner Floriano Maneno visited the Macondes, a disagreement arose after his proposal to have them participate in the Mozambique election was turned down by the residents who insisted they are Kenyans and know not about their native home. The Makonde people, who now number 40,000 on average, believe that close to a century later, they have earned their stay as Kenyan citizens, urging the Kenyan government to finally grant them an identity and read them off their title, the Nowhere People. <laughs> Question for the Kenyan government, what's next for the Makonde of Kwane? A man in Taita Taveta County is still demanding his right arm back. His arm was amputated and preserved in a mortuary in West Sub County in 2007. The 39-year-old says his hand was amputated by a machine when he was working in a sisal estate in Mwatate Sub County. He now wants his hand back so he can bury it. 39-year-old David Sunguli lost his right hand in 2007 while at work in a sisal estate in Matate sub-county. Seven years later, though, and he mourns not about the accident, but about the fate of his right hand. David says he wants what is rightfully his from the Wesu Hospital Administration. 
his right hand, which he says was taken to the hospital mortuary, even though he is still alive. He also alleges foul play by his former employer, who he accuses of tampering with his hand, which was evidence for his case against the Saisal farm. Waliweza kushirikiana na washikadao wa kampuni hiyo kuchukua hicho kingo na kukichoma kama njia ya kuficha ushahidi. Officials at the Western Hospital on their part hold a different brief as to the whereabouts of David's hand. It is true that person's hand was, was in our mortuary, but later that person came and collected that his hand for disposal at his own cost. David, who continues to lodge his case to anyone who cares to listen, says he just wants his arm back. Nacho kiungo basi kiniweze kupokezewa na nende nende kakisike kwa sababu inanipa uchungu mwingi sana. Will David finally get what is rightfully his? Evelyn Mwamboi, Citizen Live at One. Sad story there. The World Health Organization has classified Kenya as a high-risk country for Ebola transmission, calling on the government to intensify screening and monitoring of those entering the country. In connection to this, the Ministry of Health has implemented a raft of measures to prevent importation of Ebola cases into Kenya, which include an assessment of potential isolation facilities around the country to handle reported cases of Ebola. World Health Organization figures put the number of those who have died from the Ebola virus at 1,013 in three West African countries. And Kenya is now on high alert, having been ranked among countries at high risk of transmission. Unfortunately, we cannot predict how long the outbreak will last. What we can say is that the outbreak can only be considered over in the country after 42 days. The Ministry of Health now making public a raft of measures which they hope will ensure the virus does not enter the country. According to the Health Secretary, James Washaria, the Ministry is constantly getting advice from a multi-agency Ebola task force which is assessing the situation globally. An additional isolation facility will be set up at Magathi District Hospital in Nairobi. In Busia, one of the country's port of entry, the county referral hospital has set up an emergency wing for Ebola cases with nine doctors on standby for any eventualities. 226 medical health officers in the county have been trained on Ebola management. And so, what was we a total of 76 flights from West Africa land at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport weekly, most of them operated by KQ, Ethiopian Airlines and Rwanda Air. According to Kenya Airports Authority, 10,000 travelers from West Africa have been screened with an isolation room in operation at the airport. We have separated a special gate for those who are targeted. Then for the transiting passengers, we have identified a trip on the other side of the airport where the transit passengers go through. Those who have been suspected or targeted, they go through the screen. So we are not mixing them with everybody else. And while several airlines have cancelled flights to the affected areas, Kenya Airways says it will not be cancelling its flights to West Africa. It is not that all the airlines are still going to go to the other airlines at the same time. And the reason that people still fly today is because in each situation, Now, 
inmates said the Nyahururu Thompson Falls GK prison are facing a rough time after water supply to the facility was disconnected due to an outstanding bill of over 1.8 million shillings. The water was disconnected by the Nyahururu Water and Sanitation Company four days ago. Hassan Farah brings us the details. Thompson Falls Correctional Facility in Yahururu Town has been without running water for the last four days, causing a major sanitation nightmare for the inmates. The Yahururu Public Health Department says the situation in the correctional facility is bad, and the 750 inmates may have to be relocated if the situation remains the same. Like the West Subcounty Administrator Samuel Mwangi confirmed the situation, and said that efforts by his office to intervene has been unsuccessful as the prison department continues to fail to honor its pledges. The deputy officer in charge of the prison superintendent David Surrey on his part said they have sought other means to fetch water from treated wells to supply to the entire prison population. Prisoners remandees as well as prison staffs are affected by lack of water. The is because uh, we, are, we are now drawing water on a daily basis from the treated plant. That's when uh, we, that's how we are managing the situation. But you see, when there's no other animal on that taps, it's, it's not a good thing to see the hard water running in the, in the, in the taps. Speaking to the media, the Huasco Managing Director Bernard Moore confirmed the disconnection but said the situation was now manageable. He added that efforts to discuss the matter with the water company have not borne any fruits. Citizen one. Oh, that could be a cause for grave concern. We hope the situation is sorted out. We're taking a break now. Don't go away. Stay with Citizen and I. Have a Welcome back to Citizen Live at One. The ongoing conservation of Lake Naivasha has received a major boost after the government and development partners donated 90 million shillings towards the exercise. The money will be used to help manage the environment. Let's have a look. Speaking in a hotel in Naivasha, during the launch of Naivasha Marisha Water Stewardship Project, the Principal Secretary Minister of Environment, Richard Lesiampa, was full of praise for the project which aims to conserve water in the lake. The Board of Imarisha Initiative was disbanded last year, but plans are underway to create a new one next month. Uh, we have done this you know, uh, as a commitment and a demonstration of government support for uh, this initiative, where the private sector, you know, the civil society, and even the public has come on board to see to you that uh, we all play a very, very important role in environmental management. During the 10-month absence of a management board, the project has, according to Lake Basin Civil Society Organization Chair Professor Karanjan Joroke, faced many challenges, especially in the use of donor funds. He has, however, called for accountability and transparency in the management of the funds. And the community feels that, uh, in the meantime, the Imaricha is not doing what it, is, it, what it was mandated by the community and the government because of lack of an active management board. But I think good things are happening, but we need, we need the government to step up on the plate and, and, uh, and set this as a good example of how sensitive ecological zones can be managed by the people who live in that. Imarisha Chair Richard Fox said that the foreign stakeholders have already committed 50 million Kenya shillings to be distributed evenly in all 12 water resource use associations, construct water plants, tanks and plant trees as efforts towards conservation. The stakeholders have proposed that the new Marisha board must be all inclusive. Morgan, Mwenke Citizen, Live at One.
Turning to the day's business news, and the governments of Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda are currently in the process of selecting a consultant to guide the construction of a crude oil pipeline that will run from Hoima in western Uganda through the Lokichar Basin in Kenya all the way to the proposed port of Lamu. The consultant will be required to conduct a feasibility study and undertake initial designs for the proposed 1,300 kilometer oil pipeline. A fiber optic cable will also be laid alongside the pipeline. The project is part of a regional effort that is geared towards the joint exploitation of proven oil reserves that have been discovered in Kenya and Uganda. Well, turning to the tourism front now, and a local hotel chain, Pride Inn Hotels, has embarked on a five-year strategy that will see it widen its presence across the country at a cost of 8 billion shillings. Pride Inn Hotels Group Chief Executive Officer Hasnein Nurani has said the first two hotels will be constructed in Shanzu, Mombasa County, and in Kisumu County at a combined cost of 3.5 billion shillings. Nurani has said the three-star hotels would which will be equipped with conferencing facilities, will be completed by August next year. Machakos, Eldoret, and Nakuru are also on the hotel chain's expansion plans. Pride Inn Hotels will principally target business travelers for conference tourism, as well as the growing middle class within the East African region. We want to make sure that we cover every county within, uh, within Kenya. We want to provide people uh, except for products and services that are outstanding value. We want to make sure that we have a coverage region wide. We are first going to concentrate in Nairobi. Go to uh, Kisumu. Go to Mombasa. Machazu is a huge project. Most, uh, uh, supposedly the biggest in south, in north coast. Because uh, it's a 200 meter to room hotel. You know, uh, with a conference room that will only be arrived in the KICC. Because we'll be able to host almost 2,000 people under one roof in a conference room. And this is a, 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 you know, a project that is almost 60%, 70% done. It's not a dream anymore. It is a reality. Well, from tourism uh, to dairy farming, and many small-scale farmers in Kenya have shied away from value addition for fear that it's too costly. But for one young dairy farmer in Nyeri, Martin Jaroge, selling raw milk is, is not his focus. Martin, who's also a university student, opted to go a step further on the value chain to process yogurt in addition to selling milk. Tonight on Citizen TV's weekly agribusiness segment, Smart Farm, our reporter Dennis Otieno brings you Martin's inspiring story and why he chose to take the value addition route. I go to town at a hotel called the Honeyboat Hotel. During lunchtime, I used to watch people. Every time the hotel used to get full, and everyone used to wonder, I want a cup of yogurt and then I want a cup of yogurt and donut, I want a cup of yogurt and does and a cup of yogurt and bread. So I went like, why, why can't I start the business of yogurt and the milk is available? Well, for more on that, join the business team at 9 p.m. for Citizen Business Weekly. Now let's move further afield to the island nation of Madagascar. Sitting in the comfort of their own homes and offices, Malagasis are starting to take up online shopping as the island's economy slowly recovers. This is after the International Monetary Fund announced that it's resuming its relationship with Madagascar. This happened earlier this year, following peaceful elections in December. In mid-June, the IMF approved a 4.1 billion shilling emergency loan to help the country meet urgent balance of payment needs. My legacy shoppers are increasingly moving away from crowded markets to buying products online from electronic gadgets to cameras to cosmetics and shoes fueling growth in a budgeting business with an estimated 2.5 million legacies shopping online. According to government figures, many hope that the new industry will contribute towards an economic recovery as the Indian island tries to recover from the 2009 coup that prompted international donors to cut ties, leaving the economy to stagnate and poverty to deepen. There are two main reasons people shop online. 
it's cheaper or they cannot be bothered with a trip to the store. And for busy professionals, the convenience of shopping online is a lifeline. Besides the fact that I don't like going shopping, it's also because of the type of work I do. I don't have time to go run errands because I have so little free time. I'm in the office at 9 a.m. and sometimes I only get home at 7 p.m. I really don't have time. But for many others, challenges to online shopping remain. I don't use the internet to do my shopping because I prefer going physically to stores, which is a way for me to directly see the quality of the product and also have access to a larger variety of products. But entrepreneurs like Jean-Luc Arthur says he wants to change perceptions of online shopping as retailers are slowly overcoming concerns about potential online fraud. He says the portal's growth has been a fascinating journey, but admits much still needs to be done to convince Malagasy's that online shopping is a viable option. From the public point of view, this is not a sector that is well known or supported. People need to be sensitized in order to use these platforms of online transactions and to benefit from the advantages that such platforms offer, meaning saving a lot of time when it comes to transport or expenses, given that everything is done on the internet. The World Bank forecasts the economy will expand 3.7% this year and 4% in 2015. But despite a low income forecast, many hope that the popularity of e-commerce business will go towards reviving Madagascar's economy. Interesting story there. Welcome to Studio Thank you very much. I, I think generally Africa is going to, like the rest of the world, start shopping more online. It's just a progression. I was just remembering that place like that. So you to expect this night on uh, smartphone. Yes. Yeah. I think all that uh, venture, the proverbial cash cow, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what do you have yeah, for us in sports? Because Martin has struck gold in the story that he's going to be having tonight. And also, Kenya struck gold. I'll be telling you how and why after this. Stay tuned.